We are now going to take a closer look at Emily Dickinson's poem number 83, better known by its first line, I gave myself to him. At odds with extreme New England puritanical and late Victorian ideologies, this is a poem that audaciously challenges the value of marriage, subverting societal conventions in order to reach elemental truths about belonging to self. As with many other poems of Dickinson's that you will explore, there is an underlying tension between estrangement and acceptance in I Gave Myself to Him. It is worth pausing for a while to consider this idea of tension, this paradox in her poetry. A paradox is where seeming contradictions may not only coexist, but can further provoke powerful new ways of thinking in the responder. In fact, Dr Elizabeth McMahon, in her compelling essay on Dickinson's ambivalence towards seclusion entitled Longing and Belonging States, most of the energy and intensity of each poem resides in the spark of an unresolved galvanising tension between longing and belonging. And this is especially so in I Gave Myself to Him, where the desire for self-surrender tussles with a yearning for self-expression. So, when we read this poem, we want to see this paradox between isolation and unity, oppression and emancipation, as a way of giving birth to fresh thoughts about the complexities of belonging to someone else. So now, let us look at the poem more carefully. Notice first her use of six and eight syllable lines in her quatrains, a form of metre that adds a musical quality to her verse, resonating with many of the hymns she would have heard as a child during her strict Calvinistic upbringing. Notice also the personal pronoun I in the first line, the objectification of herself as a gift in marriage to him. To who, though? Be careful of notes you might have come across during your encounter with the great god Google. You will commonly find him with a capital H, along with accompanying notes on Dickinson's giving herself to her redeemer, her Christ. However, your version of the poem, set for the HSC, is edited by James Reeves and does not utilise a capital H. Perhaps the more palatable version given Dickinson's, at times, ambivalent approach to organised religion. The first stanza challenges the institution of marriage by casting it in the language of trade and barter, an extended mercantile metaphor that continues throughout the poem. Words such as pay, solemn contract, ratified, a word that means to officially sanction, paint marriage in a cynical light, a pragmatic transaction for economic gain, as it often was back then, as opposed to a ro romantic union, a holy vow. Okay. While continuing the Merkel time theme, wealth, great purchaser, the second stanza also introduces an ambiguity with the word might disappoint. Perhaps the persona is unsure of her own worth or value in such a state of conjugal belonging. Note too the half rhyme of prove and love on the page. It looks like it should rhyme, yet when spoken it isn't quite as harmonious, jarring a little. It too disappoints, perhaps symbolic of the marriage union itself. Notice too the enjambment between the second and the third quatrains. Love runs on to depreciate. The daily, mundane, domestic routine must eventually wear away at the vision. The oxymoron of depreciate with vision, perhaps reinforcing the widening gap between the anticipation and the realisation, lessening the value of the purchase as years go by. While the financial jargon continues in the stanza, women are now also portrayed as chattels, exotic and seductive, it's true, but nevertheless, still subtle cargoes, bonded property to be owned. Note to the contextual colonial allusions, merchant, isles of spice, women are dis undiscovered territory to, per to be pursued and conquered for prestige as well as financial gain. In the final stanza though, one has to question whether Dickinson is completely rejecting the institution of marriage or perhaps rather trying to reshape its parameters. She acknowledges, indeed, that it involves mutual risk for both parties. Both have to take a chance. Some find such an interdependent relationship does provide 
mutual gain. And perhaps it is only with this risk that one is open to the possibility of rewards. However, it is never guaranteed. She concludes with reference to the conjugal duty required in marriage. Sexual submission is once again portrayed as a financial transaction. However, the oxymoron of sweet debt suggests her ambivalence, perhaps even desire for such intimacy, such consummation. However, the realities of the day, the noon, leads to an awareness that marriage leaves one ultimately insolvent, in debt to the other. And for her, that means a creative bankruptcy, an inability to have an interior world of mind and soul, indeed a room of one's own in which to produce her poetry. Much has been made of Dickinson's isolation, her self-imposed alienation from society, but perhaps for her it was a much considered risk. As James Reeve states in his introduction to your edition, one that I'm sure you've read over, laboured and highlighted, she did not withdraw from the world because she hated it. It was for her a calculated choice. The loss weighed against the gain.